Welcome back to my video series on machine learning with scikit-learn. In the previous video, we defined machine learning, split it up into the two types of supervised and unsupervised learning, and then discussed how supervised learning actually works. In this video, I'll be covering the following topics. What are the benefits of scikit-learn and what are a few drawbacks? How do I install scikit-learn? How do I use the IPython notebook? And if I don't yet know any Python, what are some good resources for learning Python? So let's get started with a brief overview of some of the benefits of scikit-learn. Here are the things that I like best about scikit-learn. It provides a consistent interface to lots of machine learning models, which makes it easy to learn how to use a new model. It provides you with many options for each model so that you can tune them for optimal performance, but it also chooses sensible defaults so that you can get started quickly. Its documentation is exceptional and helps you to understand the models as well as how to use them properly. Besides just the machine learning models themselves, scikit-learn provides a rich set of functionality for companion tasks like model selection, model evaluation, and data preparation. And finally, it's under active development and has an active community on Stack Overflow and especially its mailing list. Ben Lorica from O'Reilly has a thoughtful article about why he recommends scikit-learn, which I'll link to below this video. As well, I'll link to a very readable paper written by the authors of scikit-learn describing their API design philosophy. Are there any drawbacks to using scikit-learn for machine learning as compared to machine learning in R, for example? Personally, I find that getting started with machine learning is actually easier in R, though once you've mastered the basics, it's actually much easier to go deeper in machine learning with scikit-learn. I discuss this issue in more depth in a blog post linked below, and there are lots of thoughtful comments below the post. One other potential drawback, depending upon the goals of your project, is that scikit-learn tends to have a machine learning philosophy rather than a statistical learning philosophy. What's the difference between the two? Well, machine learning places a greater emphasis on predictive accuracy, whereas statistical learning emphasizes model interpretability and uncertainty. In other words, you'll find that scikit-learn focuses more on helping you to maximize the accuracy of your models whereas R tends to offer more capabilities for understanding your models. Again, that may or may not be a drawback, depending upon your own project goals. Anyway, let's move on to scikit-learn installation. The scikit-learn website has a thorough page covering installation across various operating systems. Note that it works with Python 2 or 3, and that it requires both NumPy and SciPy. Alternatively, you could download a Python distribution that includes scikit-learn, such as the Anaconda distribution from Continuum Analytics. Anaconda is known as the scientific distribution of Python because it includes hundreds of popular packages that are useful for scientific work. As well, it includes IPython and the IPython notebook, a convenient package manager called Conda, and an IDE, or integrated development environment, called Spider. The Anaconda distribution of Python is what I personally use and recommend for my data science students, and throughout this series I'll be using the IPython notebook to demonstrate scikit-learn. However, you're welcome to use any setup that works for you. Now, 
let's take a look at the IPython notebook. We're actually looking at an IPython notebook right now. There are two main components to the IPython notebook, the IPython interpreter and a browser-based notebook interface. The IPython interpreter is an enhanced version of the standard Python interpreter that includes additional functionality such as tab completion, syntax highlighting, a better help system, access to operating system commands, and more. The browser-based notebook interface allows you to weave together code, formatted text, and plots into the same document. It was recently renamed the Jupyter Notebook to reflect the fact that languages other than Python are supported, but the functionality is the same. To install IPython in the notebook, the IPython website provides simple instructions for how to do this using pip. If you installed the Anaconda distribution of Python, you will already have IPython in the notebook, so no further action is necessary. Let's now take a look at how to actually use the IPython notebook. To launch it, simply go to the command line and type IPython, then a space, then type notebook, and hit enter. This dashboard will open which provides a list of notebooks in the current directory. You can see that I have one notebook that's running and one notebook that's not. While using the IPython notebook, it's important not to close the command line window since it's acting as the notebook server. Anyway, let's click this button to create a new notebook. You can think of this as Python running in your browser. Each block is known as a cell in which I can write one or more lines of Python code. I can then click Run or hit control and enter on my keyboard to actually execute the cell. If there's output, it's displayed below the cell. I'm now in command mode, indicated by the gray border around the cell, which allows me to create new cells above or below the current cell by hitting A for above or B for below on my keyboard. I can also navigate between cells using the up and down arrows. When I'm ready, I can hit enter to switch from command mode to edit mode, indicated by the green border, and now I can type more code. I can switch back to command mode at any time by hitting the escape key. I'll now navigate up to the first cell using the up arrow. I can hit the M key to switch the cell type from code to markdown, and then switch to edit mode by hitting enter. I can now input markdown code, which is an easy to read, easy to write markup language. I'll demonstrate some markdown code and then hit control and enter to render the cell. In a future video, I'll show you how to display plots within the notebook. In the meantime, 
you can hit the H key to see the rest of the keyboard shortcuts. Once you're done with the notebook, you can click Save and Checkpoint to save the notebook, and then click Close and Halt to shut it down. All of your code has been saved, but the environment itself has not been preserved. The next time you open that notebook, you will need to rerun the code cells in order to load the relevant objects. The final thing I want to show you about the IPython notebook is the excellent NB Viewer website. NB Viewer allows you to view a notebook that's already online without actually running it on your local computer. First, let's copy the URL to a notebook, such as the GitHub link for the notebook from my first video. Then, paste the link and click Go. and it will render the notebook in your browser. Note that this is a static HTML document. In order to actually run or edit the cells, you'll need to make a local copy of the notebook. I've listed a few resources here that you might find to be helpful. If you want to learn more about IPython itself, I recommend the official documentation. For a longer introduction to the notebook, I recommend the official IPython notebook tutorials. To learn some basic markdown, GitHub provides a nice introductory guide. To wrap up, I want to talk about a few resources that I recommend for learning Python. The first is Codecademy's popular Python course, which teaches Python in the browser and includes tons of exercises. The next is DataQuest, which has a similar interface to Codecademy but teaches Python specifically in the context of data science. Note that some of their lessons require a paid account. The third resource is Google's Python class, which is slightly more advanced, but includes hours of useful lecture videos, written guides to the material, and downloadable exercises with solutions. I like this class because it mostly focuses on areas of Python that are useful for data science. The final resource is Python for Informatics, a beginner-oriented book that also includes slides and videos. Due to its slower pace and thorough explanations, it's an excellent resource if you've never programmed before in any programming language. In the next video in this series, we'll load a famous dataset into Scikit-Learn, we'll discuss how it relates to the machine learning process, and then we'll talk about Scikit-Learn's four key requirements for working with data. As always, I'd love to hear from you in the comments if you have any questions about today's material, or if you have any resources you'd like to share. Please subscribe on YouTube if you'd like to keep up with the series. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.